Hello and welcome to The Inquisitive Friend. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a podcast that brings interviews and insights from all walks of life on the reality of being. Hello everyone, it's Shaw here. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm happy that you've returned. And if you're new here, thank you so much for joining me. And I do hope that you stick around. Happy New Year to you all as well. And I hope the year is going very well for you. I hope that you're getting everything that you you want, you ask for, you wish for, you hope for. And I hope that some new revelations about life and and being come to be for you. It's all about enlightenment, isn't it? Which has led me to the podcast today. It's a solo episode, but it's about the spiritual, it's about a spiritual law. So it will be important to, I suppose, first of all, acknowledge one of the most Um, infamous, famous, laws of relativity, well, I would say theory of relativity, which is Einstein's theory in relation to the law of relativity. I mean, they're they're the same as such. Obviously, there's a law, which is a spiritual law, and then there's Einstein's theory of relativity. So as we, well, most people know, Albert Einstein, the German-born physicist, believe that space and time are relative and they're not absolute concepts. In other words, existing or having its special nature only by relation to something else. So it's not absolute or independent, you know, it's in relation to something else. For example, uh, happiness is relative. Yes. Okay. So happiness is one we can use because, you know, it takes different things to make people happy. So in relation to how they were brought up, so in relation to something else, you know, how people are brought up, what they learned about happiness, how they view happiness, we can all be different in that regard. What makes some people happy may not make somebody else happy. So happiness, it just popped into my head, that one about happiness, but I think it's probably a good one to use, is relative. It's how each person sees it. It's not an absolute concept. It's not uh, very specific. It just depends on the person. Also, to relate, it's about linking in with a natural uh, association being associated. So this then helps to define to define it as either good or bad or helpful or unhelpful, etc. If you relate your situation to something that appears to be worse, then by what I would say is a natural association, your situation begins to look better. If you do the opposite, so if you relate your situation to something that appears to be better, then your situation will naturally appear worse. And probably the most famous example of this would be Shakespeare, who uh, in some way I think summed it up very nicely in one of his (laughs) most popular plays, Hamlet, when he said, "'Tis none to you, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And many people have quoted that, misquoted it a lot as well. Uh, but we you, we often refer to that saying, that beautiful piece of literature, that beautiful piece of uh, strung together words by Shakespeare as whatever the situation is, we will all see it depending on our way of thinking, how we think and see and process things. So thinking makes it so. So nothing's either good or bad. It's how you think about it, how you see it, how you perceive it. 
And our way of thinking about something is usually in relation to our way of thinking about something else. So here we go back to the not absolute, it's in relation to something else. And I hope you're still with me on this, because, you know, spiritual laws, we people often think that spirituality is woo-woo, it's out of the ordinary, it's, you know, out of space, it's aliens, it's um, flippy floppy, it's transparent and see-through, it's not solid or concrete. And really, I suppose a lot of that is uh, magical thinking as such, and it's um, folklore as such, you know, we have images of what we believe spirituality is all about or is but that's in relation to something else to what we think what we feel how we, we are what makes it so so our way of thinking about something is usually in relation to how we think about something else and it's all linked it's all linked to memory conditioning and something i often repeat belief systems if you listen to any of my podcasts, you will hear me often say, this is my belief system. This is how I believe. This is what I believe to be. Because we all have a belief system. And I'm the first to say I can change that based upon my learning. So some things for me are quite solid. Uh, and then some things for me can shift because I've obtained but through something else. Uh, either a person or something I've read or research, it's usually research for me, uh, that's something that I've come across, something that I believe that will alter or support, will support that belief system in a way that becomes more flexible so that I can move it around. Still a foundation of me in it, that's the relation to me, but it can change. And so we have a conundrum, really. I mean, how do we relate to something differently if we already have a memory bank of how to relate? How do we change that way in which we relate if the memory bank is there? And so some people like to refer to our brains as computers, and I can see this I can see this similarity, but of course, they are indeed very different, of course. You know, the fundamental aspect being that you can wipe a computer clean, can't you? You can, and many people have, you know, really, it's ruined their day where something disappeared, where the screen went blank. When computers first came around, and I'm sounding really ancient here, but when they really got going, you know, even before the internet, before dial-up and all that, um it was still you could just lose anything and that it, that's it it would be gone um and then you'd have to start from scratch the human brain okay there are some ways in which that can falter and so as we know we have different medical conditions like um stroke you know, brain injury acquired brain injury different things amnesia dementia there are things that can alter our memory uh, it, but even with amnesia there's still some memory there may be there may be or could be again depending on the person some memory but the brain can't really wipe it all clean exactly like a computer can there'll be something there and there was a piece of research, and you know, you guys usually, you know that I usually put links to the research I have, but I cannot find this paper. I've looked for it. It was years, 20 plus years ago, that I came across this paper about, um, it was in relation to when people lose their memory through whatever process. It was, I, and I, I, I don't remember it being particularly around, you know, stroke or anything else, or accident trauma, I think it was in, just in relation to memory, memory loss, memory gain, uh, you know, our capacity. I, I know it mentioned something about the myth that we only use 10% of the brain, all that. 
Anyway, it, but I cannot locate that paper. That paper talked a bit more about why, you know, if somebody has memory deficit, if they all of a sudden have a trauma, for instance, and they have memory deficit, why is it that they can walk? So that's memory. Why is it that they knew how to put their fork to their mouth to eat? That's memory. So that's what I'm basing my, my um, sentence on just now, that sometimes people can lose some memory. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Computers are subject to electromagnetic field and like us, often become overloaded, uh, break down, sick, they stop working, they're temperamental, they're slow, they're fast, uh, they freeze up, they get viruses, you know, that's a hot topic at the moment. They stay up too late, you know, computers, you leave them on and something can happen. Um, they're overworked, you know, you try and sometimes you try and type, if you, you, you really type really quickly. I know, I don't know if some of you have noticed this, but I've spoken to people. Sometimes the computer can't keep up. You know, they, it really can't. It, something will happen. Um, computers sometimes don't take breaks, just like us. Uh, computers let people use them, don't they? <laughs> you know, um, but they, they don't get to choose their homes, their family. They get run down. They grow old. Computers, we have to change them. They become obsolete. Um Unless they're upgraded, but even then, as we all know, especially if you had a P or have a PC, at some point it's it probably has to go. <laughs> um, they need a boost now and then. They've got to be uh, backed up. All this stuff they have to be maintained, which is what I'm getting at. They need protection against the elements, of course. The list goes on and on. So we're more alike, you know, than not. Computers and humans are more alike than not. But the law of relativity suggests that all of these components depend on how we see things, which is how I open this whole talk. If we see our computers as the only thing in our lives that fulfill us, which is a big problem at the moment, as we know, then we're looking at a machine to give us what a human being could give us. And I don't believe, now this is my belief system, I do not believe a computer can do that. I believe a computer is information. We're in the information age. It allows us to produce information and to acquire information. If we see a computer is helpful, yet temporary and time limited, perhaps a source of enrichment in our lives, you know, for a particular time we log on for something specific, then we're getting much more in touch with what's real for us as humans. But again, this is relative. It depends on how we see it. This is how I see it. It's how we think of it. This is how I think of it and how we relate to it. how we relate to it. This is how I relate to computers. I look forward to at least an entire day out of the week without turning on my Mac. I will not turn it on. That's it. Now, I may check my emails on my phone, of course. There's a reason why I must do that. I've got family. I, you know, I've got responsibility, so I must do that. Um, I have turned off notifications before, but, you know, taking a break is nice. We do that with people as well. I tend to use the analogy of the computer as the Internet's become, you know, for so many a source of entertainment, more and more and more, uh, you know, they're creating new things, new apps, you know, new shiny things that grab us and keep us from living life as we used to do. And I'm talking about socializing. And unfortunately, so many people are losing the ability to relate. Law of relativity. The law of relativity. They're losing the ability to relate to each other other than by using three letters in salutation and a text message, um, you know, or an emoji now. 
So actually speaking to someone is becoming a pastime. It's a pastime now. People don't like to answer the phone. They, they don't like to answer the door, but that's probably for good reason. You know, safety. I think this is why more people suffer from depression. They have a hard time in jobs and relationships and they're falling more into debt. And that's because they're so isolated that they're looking outside of themselves for external things to fulfill them. So we know the economy is up and down, but people are spending more money because they're bored at home. And also the big shiny new things keep popping up, giving them direction, directing them to websites, to things to buy, things to look at, things to try. And they're literally starved of human contact. Now, we could go into the whole introvert, extrovert thing. Um, the conversation and natural behavioral interaction is very natural for human beings. It's even natural for computers. Computers don't work unless we work them. The communication is a combination of verbal and nonverbal, and that's what we're missing. We can have the verbal or the visual, so the letters, the text, and the text messages. We can have all that, but there is also the non-verbal. Now, I know you, you may want to link that in. If you're quite specific, you may want to link in the text with non-verbal. But actually, as we know, writing is communication. But our way of communicating as human beings is also based upon that one-to-one -one and cues, visual cues, visual cues. But that is a part of the visual cue that I'm considering. So, and all the aspects of how we relate to each other come into play. And this is where we learn our beliefs. You know, we change our beliefs as well. We challenge our beliefs. But this is the start of change. If you're in contact with someone and you are relating, you're in a conversation, those unconscious uh, nonverbal cues will be informing how you see things and that will be in relation to something else that something else will be your beliefs how you view things how if you if you believe that when somebody tilts their head to the side they're querying you they they or they're questioning or really considering what's being said um or if somebody purses their lips as you say a word or something, you, you may have a belief system about that that you're fully unaware of. The way to relate is to participate and to interact with people face to face. I mean, the personas that are invented on, and I won't, I won't spend lots of time on this, but we know that people invent personas on Twitter and Facebook and lots of different apps and all different types of sites uh, that are not what you will see face to face up close and personal. You can build up a repertoire of relating from actually relating, nothing else. You're unable to build up a, um, you're unable to build a, an honest, and a real way of relating or repertoire of relating uh, from a persona. And so the law of relativity is all about how you see things and how you relate to everything, people and things, concepts in life, all of it. It's what you think about it. And this is a spiritual law. And so this is why whatever you think, whatever you're thinking, whatever you believe, which is why I talked about belief systems. So whatever you believe, whatever you think and think about, it will be in relation to something else. And so the way in which we can become more aware of the law of the spiritual law of relativity and how it works, how whatever we think about things may appear or will inform what happens next because it's the concept of 
our thinking makes it so, then we can learn to change the outcome of that relation, the outcome of how it affects our lives and the outcome of how we affect the universe. So I hope that's helpful. Think about the law of relativity, that spiritual law of relation and relationship. And I hope, my, my biggest hope for this talk is that it will inspire you to become more relative, to seek those relationships, to seek relating to people and to seek change in how you relate and to perhaps improve, increase more one-to-one, face-to-face relations because you will have a much more enriched experience. And just a quick quip on that because I know people do struggle with that relation, you know, being around people face to face. People are working from home more, but also people do find relationships quite prickly. And without blaming the other persons all the time, and a lot of time it is other people's faults, we know, um, but a lot of times it could be our own fault as well. But if you look at somebody's background and what they're used to, then you, you know, they show up with who, with all that stuff, with all that relation. That's what they show up with. However, because thinking makes it so, it will affect how you leave with it. If it has affected you spiritually, mentally, you know, physically, you know, because we can become very drained with other people's exertion of energy especially if the, if the energy they're exerting is very deep, dark, and negative, it can affect people. If you walk into a room and at least one person is depressed, if you're very empathic, you'll feel that. You'll feel that dep- depressed person's energy. And if you're not depressed, it can get you down. So you have to be aware of the relation how you relate to it, how you think about it. And maybe I need to, uh, it's just becoming clear to me that I need to touch upon that aspect as well for empaths and how you can help yourself and stop yourself from becoming too bogged down with that. But as I close this out today, because I don't want this to be too long, I just wanted to introduce the law of relativity in the way in which we relate to people, to other people. It can be quite prickly for people. You could stop or help to control and help to manage, is probably a better phrase, that prickliness that you may feel in relation and one-to-one and being in front of people by considering how you think, what you think, how you see it. Thinking makes it so. So if you believe that you're going into a situation where let's say you've got to meet with people you've never met with before and you automatically become a little bit anxious or maybe I'm very anxious about it, thinking makes it so. So what are you fearing? You know, this is the this is the law of relativity. What are you fearing? Are you fearing that the, the relation, how you relate will come across wrong or you won't, won't like them? This is all relative, all relationships. Remember, happiness is relative. So you could come out to that meeting or you could approach that meeting with, I don't know how it will come out. All I know is that I will go in and do the best that I can. I will show up positively as me. And if you don't like the word positive, you could say, I will show up as me. However that will be. But remember, your aim is to start to change the thinking that makes it so. You can't change the law. (laughs) Thinking makes it so. So you, you won't be able to change the law of relativity. It's a spiritual law. But you can begin to change how it affects you. 
And to do that, you must change how you think, how you see, how you feel about it. Nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And please let me know in the comments how you view the law of relativity. What has your experience been regarding relativity and relation, relationships, how you relate to people, how you see things, how you believe people relate to you as well. There's, there'll be something in that too. So it will be helpful to know from you all your thoughts. I look forward to reading your comments. Please leave us a comment. Leave us a review. The reviews really help the podcast. Although we're growing, it would be nice to have more reviews. So let me know what you think, what you'd like to see on the podcast. Uh, who you'd like to see. We've got some great guests coming up, but let me know. Have a wonderful afternoon wherever you are in the world. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Nine Peaches Therapy self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by helping you to achieve confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. Created by an expert practitioner, to help you to achieve the best result. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day using the most gentle and effective guided meditations to rid yourself of anxiety, stress, fear, and negative thinking. Available now on Spotify, Apple Music, and other platforms. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.